Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Bray Radio Show. You can hear in the background, there's a nice crowd on hand here tonight. It is a cold South Bend night, perfect time of year for basketball because there's nothing else to do. You don't want to go outside. There are no distractions. You can just focus on basketball, and boy, this team has. They came into the week, ranked 23rd in the AP poll, 21st in the coaches poll, but right now, Notre Dame is one of just two undefeated teams already in the ACC. Notre Dame and Florida State are the only two undefeated teams. They are both in first place after a couple of thrilling victories. Winning at Pitt in overtime, 78-77 on Saturday. On a last second, actually two seconds left, three-point bomb from the corner by Steve Astoria. And then last night, It was a hard-fought game, but Notre Dame led for nearly 38 minutes of the game, and they beat ninth-ranked Louisville 77-70. Notre Dame has now beaten Louisville in Purcell Pavilion six straight times. And I think Coach Bray, if Rick Pitino didn't have the respect he has for you, he would start to refuse to come here. (laughs) We've been on a pretty good run against those guys. We really have, and, uh, you know, I think one of the keys – Last night was our crowd, Jack. They were great. I, was, I always worry about these games without the students here. But um, we had great energy in the building, and we needed our crowd to escape. But um, it's great to be 2-0 in this league. It's the best league in America. I think we'll get 10 or 11 NCAA tournament teams in. Uh, but as hard as this league is, and you look around at scores, and Louisville's 0-2 in the league. Virginia's 1-2 in the league. Um, teams that are thought of to be in the top three or four. To be 2-0 and is a great position. If we could get this thing to 3-0 and before we go back on the road again, it would be fabulous. And, I mean, and you look at Louisville, in between their two conference losses, they played their last <laughs> non-conference game, and they beat IU handily down in Indianapolis. Pittsburgh won last night after losing to you guys. It's a league that is just – I'm not sure – it has the makings of the best league that I have ever been around. And you've been off to some pretty good starts in your 17 years here. But because of the significance of the people you were playing and the way you were able to pull out the wins, I'm not sure you've ever been off to a better start. Yeah, I'd agree. You know, it's, it's, it's just such a fine line in conference basketball. It comes down to game situations and making decisions, getting stops, making big free throws, making big shots. And um, we certainly have done that uh, to escape, to get to 2-0. and you know, So much of league wins and so much of earning enough league wins to get in and say term of bid is performing in game situations and believing you can win close games. And we, we really have done that in our first two, and it's a great trait to have, and I hope we can ride it the rest of the way. The folks here at O'Rourke's and the monitors and those watching uh, at home and watching D and we archive the show. You can watch it later on, and we our staff does a great job of illustrating uh, for those uh, entities with video what we're talking about. But you just saw the highlights of the Villanova game. Steve Astoria throwing in a spectacular runner uh, at the end of the game. This really seals the victory for you. He's creating his own shot against one of the best defensive teams in the country. In the two games, when you go back to the pit game, where he had kind of a, a tough game till the final minutes, he right. was responsible for your last 10 points. You know, it's funny. He's one of those guys. He's just so mentally tough, and he's poised um, that, you know, he kind of let the game come to him. I mean, in Pittsburgh, I had basically next year's starting lineup playing and getting us an eight-point lead, and that means Rex and TJ in for VJ and, and Steve. But we put both those seniors back in to finish. And certainly Steve really woke up and made big, big plays for us. Jack, the thing that I'm really excited about is we played two games and we've kept two teams yeah. under 40% field goal percentage defense. It's a little bit of new territory for us that we can defend. And we've been able to, in these two wins, get stops at the end of regulation and overtime, key times. And last night, under four minutes, get three stops in a row. We call them kills when you get three stops in a row. Um, where what we're doing on the defensive end is, is new territory, and it's really been a difference maker for us uh, to, to be 2-0 and in the league. And to support what you just said, I checked all the stats today, and I know it's a small sample. It's two games, but after two games, Notre Dame leads the ACC in field goal percentage defense. 
That has never happened no. before. We've never, we've never been in that area, you know, and we, we haven't. And we've always been gifted offensively. And everybody around the country loves to watch us play on the offensive end. And we're still beautiful to watch on the offensive end because we know who we are and we can make big shots and we pass the ball. Uh, but what we're doing back on that defensive end, and you couple of that with good defensive rebounding, that has got us to 2-0 and more than anything on the offensive end right now. And another thing is you've got, I call them the big three right now, who have consistently come out and really delivered. Steve Astori said the last 10 actually had the last 12. He had the two free throws at the end of regulation at Pittsburgh. He assisted on a Bonzi Colson basket and scored the other eight uh, of the 10 in overtime. And the two games, he had 39 points, eight rebounds, six assists, three steals, a block, and two game-winning shots. But it's not just him. Matt Farrell has been rising to the occasion yep. since you gave him the ball. In these two games, 38 points, five assists, eight rebounds, two steals, had a career-high tying 22 against Louisville, and he's just making incredible shots. In fact, I said last night at one point after one of those runners over a seven-footer that <laughs> Matt Farrell is making the extraordinary look ordinary because he does it every time he has the ball. I'll tell you a good story about him as a freshman. We were talking about this as a staff. We do game situations. So he's in here as a freshman. He's got Demetrius Jackson and Jaron Grant, you know, to play against every day. Well, he would be the point guard on the blue team. And the white team had a hard time winning game situations in the preseason because Matt Farrell was making a big shot or a big play for the blue team. We stopped doing game situations for a while because it was demoralizing the starters. So you, you knew you had a guy with a great edge. He's a winner. There's great toughness about him. Certainly how he delivered in the NCAA tournament last year. We throw him into that. He's unfazed, plays great basketball. You know, by June, it's his team. He took the ball. He was the quarterback. And he's really made us believe. There's no question with his play, his edge and his toughness and his belief, his teammates are more confident. Uh, and it's just a great story. You know, it's a great story of a guy who's worked and gotten better and always wanted to come play at Notre Dame. You know, his family, are, they're big Notre Dame people. And uh, so it, it's, one of those, it's one of those great stories that I think a lot of people around the country root for a guy like Matt Farrell. In fact, his mom and dad are here tonight. Thank you for coming. Oh, they yeah, have been great them. supporters yeah. Of, yeah. of this program. And, and I think one of the reasons a lot of folks picked you for seventh in the ACC was they figured, well, you lost Demetrius Jackson, and who's going to replace him? Yeah. And, and Farrell has been just as good and his time's more consistent. Well, you know what's interesting is we've lost two point guards to the NBA. But if you look at Matt Farrell's efficiency right now, it's every bit as good as Jaron Grant's and Demetrius Jackson's. It really is. And um, he's setting a great tone for us. You know, he and Steve love playing together. It must be a New Jersey thing. Those two guys always sit together on the charter. You know, they're watching the same movie or playing the same game. And I, I think it's been neat to watch those two guys grow uh, in my opinion, one of the best backcourts in the country. And you have maybe the toughest matchup in the country. Bonzi Colson. At 6'5", Bonzi Colson is leading the ACC in rebounding at 10.7 per game. In the last two games, at 6'5", against two of the biggest teams you'll play all year. He had 39 points, three block shots. And, and this stunned me today when I added it up because I just didn't put it together. Against Pitt and Louisville, Bonzi Colson. At 6'5", got 28 rebounds. He is um, a nose for the ball guy. There's, you know, certainly the wingspan helps him. He, you know, the body's deceiving because the wingspan's really long. But you got to have some instincts and a nose for the ball. And he's always had that. When we started watching him in high school and out on their summer circuit with the, in the EYBL circuit, the Nike team he played on, he just is always around it, making plays, getting his hands on it, getting second shots. He's one of those guys, and I compare him a little bit to Heron Goaty on the offensive end. He just finds the bucket. You know, his feet may not be fundamentally the right way when he shoots his jump hook, but the thing's going in the basket because he just has that gift. And um, now that he's a junior, he's leading for us too. He's become a better defender for us. Uh, but right now, um, he's just playing as well as anybody in the country. And to exceed the expectations of others sometimes, People have to exceed what people expect them to do, and maybe even the staff. I'm not sure you expected Martinus Gevin to be 
this steady and this effective. He just missed his first double-double at Pitt, 10 yeah. points, 9 rebounds, and he only played, what, 28 minutes because he was in foul trouble. Right. And he didn't get frustrated because he got, he got some tough calls there. Last night his numbers weren't great, but, boy, he started to bang around those big guys. He took two charges. Yeah. He really helps you on the floor, and he sets great screens. No, he's had a great impact. You know, we, we were not going to get anywhere. You know, we needed Matt Farrell and Martin Gebbin to really emerge in their roles. Well, we know what Matt Farrell's done. And you know what? Martin Gebbin's not far behind right now. He continues to get more confident every week. You know, those older guys that he plays with continue to get him confident. He gives us a physical presence. You know, we substituted him again there in the second half when they started to get to our offensive board. They're, you know, they're getting putbacks. And he kind of holds guys off. You're right, he made two big charges. Pittsburgh, he was fabulous. He'll continue to get better for us and more confident, and we need him. And certainly a bunch of other guys have been contributing. We'll talk about those guys right after this first time out. It's the Mike Bray Radio Show live from O'Rourke's Public House. Welcome back to the Mike Bray Radio Show live from O'Rourke's Public House. We talked about guys who are putting up big numbers. Uh, other than uh, Martinus, who is being very effective, but you've got a couple of other guys who have been real keys to this team in Rex Fluger and our guest tonight, so we can save some of the praise to when he gets up here, but T.J. Gibbs. They were critical of the pit game in yeah, particular. Yeah, th those two guys give us a real toughness, and we know, you know, Rex did that for us last year. He came off the bench and defended and, and you know, made tough plays, got his hands on loose balls. You know, he's an improved playmaker. We know his assist to turnover is a high. And, and he's an improved shooter. You know, he doesn't hunt it at the volume of Matty or Steve or VJ, and he shouldn't. But his percentage is good because he picks his spots. TJ Gibbs been a great addition. You know, there's, a, there's toughness. There's energy. He's unafraid. I like playing him with Matt Farrell. You know, I think we can still keep looking at more and more of that because that's effective. And, and of course, you know, when you think about next year's starting lineup, that's a pretty good lineup with Farrell, Gibbs, Fluger, Colson, Gebbin. You know, when I think forward, matter of fact, that was the group on the floor that gave us an eight-point lead second half of the Pittsburgh game. So those two guys, you know, d defensive ability, intensity, energy, they got Billy to drive the ball, toughness. They really help us coming off the bench. And against Pitt, in addition to his defense, uh, TJ did have nine points, two assists, and again, no turnovers. This is a freshman who's been thrown into the thick of major college basketball and almost never turns the ball over. Well, you know, when we, we talk about, we've talked about him in the preseason, and there were big expectations for him to be a key guy, and he's absolutely delivered, and then some, you know, coming in and playing. He's playing on a really good team, and he knows how to fit in with guys. Um, but, you know, when you're the youngest of, of three and the two older brothers are We're pretty good. real good darn players and, and you have to play one-on-one -on -one against them and you got to fight for your food and everything, you know, there's a toughness about him, I guess, being the youngest from that family. Again, it's that New Jersey guard thing. I got this New Jersey guard thing going on. Bastoria, Farrell, uh, Gibbs. I, I need to go back and get some more New Jersey guards. Who else has pleased you to this point? D.J. Beecham has played well for us. He, he has not shot it well or maybe got as many shots lately. Um, but for him, you know, I, I, I think we can tend to overanalyze him on the outside. We certainly don't on the inside. You know, he's a guy that has to get it coming through our system. You know, when we break down, he's a guy that gets it in transition a little bit. He's not a guy that's going to just create it off the dribble. I thought last night he did a good job of not – forcing anything, moving the ball, and then defending on the other end, even though shots weren't going in. That's a senior. That's a guy that was all about his team winning. Um, he's going to have big nights, and there's other nights, you know, he's not going to be getting 15 or 18. But, you know, I think all our guys, not just VJ, understand we have different ways of scoring the ball. And one of the points I made to him today is you see a lot of teams that will take bad shots. You know, for the most part, we don't take bad shots. That's really helped us. And that's guys knowing who they are and believing in how we play on the offensive end. And you mentioned to me before the show that the reason he didn't take more shots last night was he didn't get many. Louisville, number one three-point field goal defensive team in the country, and they treated him like he was leading the league. And, and he's, he's been shooting it very well throughout the years. It's just his numbers have come down enough that he's not ranked. But they wouldn't give him a shot. Well, one of, the, one of the reasons we got great drives last night was they really hugged our shooters. 
you know, VJ really took a guy out of the play almost every offensive possession. You look at some of the drives that Matt Farrell, Steve, and even TJ Gibbs had, there was really nobody in the paint once they got by their guy because they were so aware of three-point shooters. Well, you look at the tape, it's a guy hugging Beecham over in the corner because he was told, don't help off of him. So, you know, I, I was trying to tell him today, you, you kind of did your job on the offensive end by keeping a defender away the whole game. You won points in the paint last night against a huge Louisville team. Two 6'10 guys in the rotation, the seven-footer in Mahmoud, who's a, is a heck of a defensive influencer uh, on the floor for them. You won 34-32. You got to the line 25 times, and you made 22. And you go back to your two disappointing losses because they're games against top teams you thought you should have yeah. won. You only got to the line six times against Villanova, didn't get to it many times against Purdue, got dramatically outshot at the line, and you weren't playing the same way. And I know you made a decision to emphasize attacking the basket after uh, you lost to Purdue. Yeah, I think we can drive the ball more. We're such a good shooting team that maybe sometimes we'll settle for jump shots, and I don't want to tell good shooters to turn one down because, you know, we're confident from out there, and it's a great weapon. But I think sometimes after movement where we can just go and we got hand checks, we got into the bonus early in the second half because of drives. Steve's drives especially picked up a lot of team fouls to get us to the bonus. And anytime we can get to the bonus and get to the foul line, we are leading the nation from the foul line. You know, it's an amazing weapon. Last night, it was a weapon. You're 13 and 2 with a virtually new coaching staff. Uh, Coach Swanigan and Coach Bolanis are the only holdovers. Uh, but you've got Eric Atkins back uh, doing all your dirty work, running the video yeah. and whatnot. You've got Ryan Ayers and Ryan Humphrey. And I've seen you energized in a different way in practice because you got in such a rhythm uh, with Martin uh, and with Slow uh, that a lot of times you, they just did their thing and you yep. supervised it and you were the CEO. But, but now you're the CEO who's rolling up his sleeves and you're really getting into it a little bit more than you were, almost like you're also teaching those two new guys uh, the way you want things done and the way things need to be done to have success. Well, there, I think there's a big responsibility, just like I feel it, to develop our players and have them get better. I have some young assistants now that, that really need to be taught. Well, the one thing you can say is we wouldn't be 13-2 and two unless this staff transition went smoothly. You know, these guys played for us, played for me, know Notre Dame, know our system, and have been great connecting with our guys, Humphrey with our big guys, Ryan Humphrey, Ayers really working with guards, and, and really knowing how to help guys off the court and pulling a guy aside who may be down or may not be playing as much as he wanted. Again, you, you're not going to be 13-2 and two unless that, that, that happens smoothly. So I'm really pleased with how those guys – and you're right, it, it, there's youth, and so it energizes me. You know, and, and I wanted to debunk one myth because when you look at the evidence, it's not true. But you heard it. People say, well, you know, he doesn't have a big guy coach. They don't coach big guys. Well, Jack Cooley did pretty well. Heron Goody did pretty well. Zach August – developed pretty well yep. so I think that's a misnomer but you now got two guys in Ryan Ayers and Ryan Humphrey in particular who can still play I mean if Ryan wants to demonstrate something either one Ayers can still steal the ball and make the pass yeah. and Humphrey can still block the shot of anybody <laughs> on the team what kind of dynamic is that when guys are are being coached by guys who are a little younger and you have such a young vibe you don't look or act as old as you are but these young guys who can I really identify they were they played for you they're part of the recent history and they can actually still do it well it's really neat when we break down and the big guys go down with coach Humphrey and the guards go down with coach Ayers and I look down there in that session and they're moving and bouncing around and demonstrating and running and sweating and they're two of my guys and how they're moving I remember when they moved for me in a uniform and helped us win a lot of games and made me look darn good as a coach that is really something I'm proud of, to see those guys. And I had Eric Atkins sitting with Matt Farrell before practice and talking about being a point guard and the things he went through. We've got so many good resources with that group. And then you put Rod Bolanis in my right-hand man spot, who has unbelievable memory of things we've done for 17 years. I just like the makeup of our group, and I think because our, our staff has such great chemistry and energy – we're 13-2, and 2-0 two, two and in the league. No question about that. It's a great start. We've got some questions from our audience here at O'Rourke's. We'll get to those right after this timeout. The Mike Bray Radio Show, live from O'Rourke's Public House. Dave. 
Welcome back to the Mike Bray Radio Show, live from O'Rourke's Public House. I want to invite you to come on out to the game Saturday, 3 o'clock against Clemson. We'll do a little scouting report at the end of the game, but they are incredibly talented as well. They have three guys in the top 19 of scoring in the ACC. Notre Dame's got three in the top 12, but it's going to be a tough game. There's only about 250 tickets still available for that game, and... You know, I am appreciative of any fan that ever comes out. And you got other things to do with your money. You're busy. But this team really does deserve some sellouts this year with the way they have already played. So uh, call the ticket office tomorrow. Stop by. 250 tickets left. Bob Curl is here from South Bend. Hey, Coach, how do you explain the rise of Matt Farrell at the end of last season, virtually no minutes to starter? Well, I mean, he, he, you know, when you think about his year last year, and it wasn't easy. It was very hard. And uh, he was in the rotation for us early. You know, we don't win at Illinois exactly. in the ACC Big Ten without Matt Farrell. And as the year went, you know, Fluger got in there and was defending and guarding some bigger guards in the league and played great at Duke, and we kind of rode him then for a while. And then, you know, we looked and said, we need to move again. We need to get moving. People were really loading up on Demetrius Jackson. He was walking the ball up the floor. And Maddie's a guy that pushes it um, to have two ball handlers on the floor. We, we put him in there and played the NC State game. We had lost three or four. And we put him in there, and he played great in the NC State game. We got some easy buckets. We were moving. And we made a decision to start him, which, you know, I think was a pretty bold move. But... We were extremely confident in it, given, you know, what we knew he could do and how he reacted in big games. And, you know, he delivers in the Michigan game. Against Stephen F. Austin, we had to have two point guards on the floor. They're pressing us the whole game, and and that's why him and TJ on the floor last night against Louisville was important, another ball handler. Um, And so he, you know, continually delivered and got better. And, you know, what he learned, he's gone through – he's gone through – becoming more of a quarterbacking guard. You know, he's more verbal and vocal running a team and telling guys where to go. His, his, his ball, care for the ball has gotten better. He's, he's a better decision maker with the ball. He's cut down turnovers that maybe he had as a young guard. And, and so he's, he's, be, he's become a better half-court guard. You know, he's always been able to go and move. He's now quarterbacking in his voice and – And it's really neat to see in our huddles before I get into the huddle at timeouts how he's talking to guys on the team. It's It's his group. I saw some of those early practices when he turned it over a lot, but now he's found that edge Mm -hmm. where he can keep his aggressive edge, but also protect the ball. We're going to, you know, and for him, he's going to throw a couple away. There's no question because we want him playing downhill and going for it. Uh, But I think he's just become more of a all round point guard quarterbacking kind of guard. I missed the last uh, turnover reading the stats last night. And I saw him. I said, you know, 11 turnovers, three, three, it's not big. Because we had, I had four, and we had 12. Yeah. And that's not acceptable. So well, it was, he was all over. Well, it. the one thing we've really beat into him here, you know, for years is taking care of the ball. And, you know, he's not the only one that reacts that way. Really against that ball pressure and trapping and guys running through passing lanes, 12's a pretty good night against yeah. Louisville. It really is. The other thing I was impressed with, they blocked some shots. And we were completely unfazed. We just pick it back up and drive it again. And, you know, that's a maturity and a poise where some guys get their shot blocked and they're a mess Mm -hmm. for 20 minutes. And we just kept playing. Wade's here from South Bend, one of the pressing fashion questions of our time. Will you bring back the turtleneck? You know, the mock can always return. You know, fear the mock. We can always bring that thing back. I'm thinking maybe we should have a throwback mock night and see if we can get the students in uh, mock T-shirts from Under Armour, of course, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, right now, I think I'll stay with what I got. My daughter talked me out of the mock. She said, Dad, uh, I think you've got to change it up. That's a little old. So good advice on her part. Jerry Liss is always here. Jerry, I think we've answered your question. Was it your plan against Louisville to attack and then drive the basket against those big yeah. guys? Yeah, we really wanted to drive it because we, you know, and, and we looked at the tape of, of last year. You know, they switch a lot. As you saw, you know, Steve had a big guy on him. Matty Farrell had a big – just drive them. Just drive them and, and make them react and make plays. And um, A lot of times when we drove, like I said, there was not help. So when they're not helping, you're looking to finish the play. We finished a lot of them. They blocked a couple. A couple they blocked, Bonzi cleaned up and exactly. laid in, you know, because they got out of position. But um, I think that's something on Saturday we're going to emphasize again. We will emphasize that again is – Let's, let's be ready to drive that ball because, 
it, it breaks the defense down, but we get fouled and we get to the bonus. And if we can shoot free throws, that's a good thing for the number one free throw shooting team in the country. Another reason why you have the success you've had so far is this team's really coachable. And I was impressed with the game plan when you made a point of, you know, when Louisville does that dribble handoff weave back, the big guys don't handle the ball that well. And you wanted to disrupt it. And you wanted to, to get in there and maybe turn those guys over. Ray Spaulding, one of their 6'10 centers, had four turnovers. Dangadello has it all the time. He had two turnovers, and you held him one of six yep. from three. They executed that part of the game plan, and it really messed up Louisville in the half court. One of our great advantages is our basketball IQ. You know, we really have intelligent guys, and we have intelligent basketball guys. So we can go walk through a team's stuff, and we were doing that some today with Clemson. And our guys can get a feel of it, and they can talk it out. And, and, you know, I don't ever go in with an exact plan. I like to run through some stuff and then ask our guys, what are you comfortable with there? Should we blow that dribble exchange up? Should we go under? Should we switch that? I, I like to hear them because they, they really have a great feel for who they are defensively. Our numbers say it. Another guy that's always here, Gary Rivers. What impact? has the great bench play made in your decision-making in subbing people? Well, I, I think you're confident, really confident in nine guys, you know, those four guys coming off the bench. So you feel you can take guys out, your starters out, and get them a rest for the stretch run. And sometimes you feel like maybe <laughs> at Pittsburgh at times I'm thinking, I don't know if I'm going to put Steven VJ back in because we're playing pretty well. But then it was time to come back to your guys. And um, so I, I think it keeps us fresher. Um, it keep, what, it, what our depth has helped us with the most is our defense. We're able to stay fresh defensively. Three of the four guys we substitute in there are excellent defenders, TJ, Torres, Rex. And Matt Ryan is underrated. He's improved in that area. So we come in with guys that can guard, and then their bodies are fresh. Like Torres is a great example. He comes in the other night. He's fresh. Oh, yeah. Boom, boom, boom. He's flying around. He's making plays. So it's, it, the, the, the depth has helped our defense. Austin Torres played four minutes last night. He had six points, <laughs> two blocks, a steal, a rebound, and he didn't miss a shot from the floor or the free throw line. He was unbelievable. I mean, and, you know, he's going to get those short spurts, those short windows. And, um, you know, and, and he's, he's delivered. Like last night was amazingly efficient, coming in, flying around. Um, we need him to do that. And, you know, the one thing I'm so pleased about with him is he's not a captain, but he is a strong leader of this team. And always talking in our locker room timeouts, he only plays one minute at Pittsburgh. It was kind of Martin Gebbin night, and he plays one minute. But every huddle down the stretch – He's talking to Bonzi. He's talking to Matt Farrell. He's grabbing Vastoria. And I think because his head is so good in a situation like that, he can come back last night and play more and have really great impact. He's, he knows who he is, and um, he's a very key part of things. You know when you're playing well, you get a lot of fashion questions. Brandon Liss also wanted to know about the turtleneck. That's two fashion <laughs> questions, which means things on the court are going well. Renee Buell and her husband, Doug, Two great season ticket holders. They're here as well. Congrats on the Louisville game. Did Coach Patino have any interesting comments for you at the end of the game? No, you know, he and I are very close, as, as you probably read. He coached me in a basketball camp when I was a rising senior, 1978, up in the Poconos of Pennsylvania. We remained close, you know, through the Big East days and the ACC. You know, Rick had a son, Mike, who's yeah. a graduate of oh, yeah. Notre Dame. So he has a special affinity to this place maybe that's why i don't think he can win here i hope i hope that continues but um he's always been really supportive of me i like hanging out with him in the road on the road we give each other a hard time um uh, we have a good relationship he was very gracious and congratulated us Folks, you can see more and sit closer at Fighting Irish Basketball Games with Vivid Seats. Visit und.com backslash ticket exchange, the official ticket marketplace of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. The Notre Dame Ticket Exchange powered by Vivid Seats. When we come back, we'll introduce you to T.J. Gibbs. Welcome back to the Mike Bray Radio Show, live from O'Rourke's Public House, presented by TireRack.com. Our guest tonight, T.J. Gibbs, 
Six foot, three inch, just confirmed, 200 pound <laughs> freshman out of Scotch Plains, New Jersey. The leading scorer in the history of Seton Hall Prep. Pretty darn good basketball <laughs> program in New Jersey. He's played in all 15 games, averaging five points, shooting 38% from three, but maybe most impressive. Uh, he doesn't have enough assists and turnovers to be ranked, but his assist to turnover ratio is four. That would lead the league if he had more. Matt Farrell right now is eighth at 2.3. He doesn't turn the ball over. So where did this poise come from? Because I know it is a tough adjustment from high school to college, but it hasn't seemed that tough to you. Are you making it easier, look easier than it is? Uh, definitely. It, it's on our uh, leaders, uh, Steve, VJ, Matt, uh, just helping me stay calm throughout the game, whether it's pressure or relax, 2-3, uh, man. Just helping me get through it, uh, see what's happening on the court, and making sure that I'm making the right plays too. Coach, I know guys like Danny Miller, Jordan Cornette might be upset if I say this, but this may well. It has the makings of the best defensive team that you have had since you've been here. Yeah, I would agree with that. There's no question, Jack. This group, you know, with the field goal percentage numbers that we're in right now, we've just never seen that, you know, and I'm – Hoping we can do it again. Can we keep Clemson under 40%? And you know what's neat? Our, the group talks about that. I don't really have to talk about that. They know they got something going on the defensive end. And I love this was about four years ago you added kills to practice, the three straight stops. So what is it, you know, when you're growing up high school and stuff, defense isn't any fun. Defense is something you have to do other than steals and block shots. People are always gambling. And if you gamble, you get burned. You guys don't gamble unless you have a really legitimate shot at making the play. And very, very seldom do you get out of, out of position, you or Maddie or anybody on the team. What is it about this team and the way you have approached defense as if defense is as much fun as offense? I think it definitely starts in practice. Uh, kills is something that's it's kind of like bragging rights in a way, uh, in a way mm -hmm. that the blue squad is always trying to outdo the white team. And then it comes back, the white uh, squad always gets a, a big stop or a big kill, and it's just always nonstop back and forth. I think that's like a, a great dynamic to this team that it's able to carry over onto the game and just keep it going with confidence on the defensive end, no matter who's in the game. Uh, we each have each other's back, whether it's uh, uh, me and Matt on the court or me and Rex or whoever it is. Uh, we know the back line has our back and that we're just going to stay solid and, and it'll, it'll happen. Do you sense on the floor when you're getting the upper hand on the other team defensively? Um, one thing that we like to say in the locker room is uh, stay poised and just let them collapse. And uh, we have a, a bunch of hashtags and stuff like that. And uh, that's something that we really pride ourselves on, whether we're going through a tough time or, or we can see them start to collapse. We're going to keep our poise out the game. And that's a big huddle. Uh, coach always comes in. Uh, he has his common look that just calms all of us down no matter what. And uh, it just we see it in our captains and our leaders, and it just carries straight through the team. You've been a run team, a spurt team this year. Others have been as well. Other guys that I know might be upset about the defensive moniker is Connaughton and Grant. <laughs> right. Uh, and certainly the epic run you had against Carolina in the ACC championship game. But what is it about? It appears that making runs and knockout punches is becoming part of the psyche of this program. Well, I think you have to have great mental toughness and tough kids. Um, you know, guys that haven't played with an edge about them. You know, T.J. Gibbs plays with an edge. Matt Farrell has an edge about him. Bastoria, in his own kind of sneaky, quiet yeah. way, has a big-time edge about him. Bonzi Colson has an edge. Rex Fluger has an edge. Matt Ryan has an edge. And it's one of those things in recruiting we've tried to identify, to have some guys that got a little something to them. Um, and you get enough of them on, on one roster like we have right now, the stuff that they talk about, you know, now we got to put, now we got to put them away. Now let's take their heart. That's, that's their verbiage and stuff. You know, they, they have that. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a fun kind of group to coach. I'll be honest, just as an observer and a follower of the team who's connected, I'd rather have won these first two ACC games than those two games that sandwiched exam week. But when you go back to that week, uh, you had the number one team in the country on the ropes. You couldn't, couldn't hang on. Great first half, not a good second half. You're upset, but nobody, nothing to be ashamed of. Then you get 17 points up in Purdue, 
and you let that get away with another poor second half. What did this team do to collectively come together? So then when you go to Pittsburgh and you actually don't get off to a good start, you fall behind by 11, you come back and win in overtime. Louisville comes all the way back and ties, but you make the plays, you finish down the stretch. What happened to this team after those two disappointing losses that allowed you to step it up now? And, I mean, I, I was listening to the, uh, the Louisville, uh, some of their media feeding back to Louisville last night, and they said every time Louisville made a run, somebody on Notre Dame made a shot. Where does that come from? Uh, I, I definitely think it comes from our senior leaders and our trust in each other. Uh, I mean, especially in those two games, uh, we, we were kind of upset in the locker room at the end of the game. We knew that uh, we, we could have done some things differently as a team, and, and we stuck together. Like, we, we, we had each other's back. Uh, it was definitely after the game, whether it was in our, our group chat that we called brothers or, or just being together as a unit after the game. Um, I think that we really grew up after that, and we knew that we weren't going to let it happen again. Your dad played football at Temple. You, we mentioned your two brothers, Sterling, played at a very high level at Texas Seton Hall and UConn. Bra Ashton was a star at Pitt, one of the most productive players they've had. I know it looked like you were going home for that game at Pittsburgh. Coach Ashton, where the family sits and everything, when you're talking <laughs> about that. How does coming from a family that is used to high athletic achievements, how has that helped you on the path to what appears to be a guy that, that may achieve more than anybody? Uh, it definitely helps that I, I can lean on them for anything, uh, whether it's on the court, off the court. Uh, each of them have had different experiences, but also I've gone through it um, all, all, everything I've gone through, they, they can relate in one way or another. And I get three different perspectives on a, a situation, and it's just always to have a, another outlook on something, whether it's uh, on the court or off the court, just, just really sticking to them and, and really being able to listen to them too. You had a lot of choices. Some of the schools that offered you from the ACC, Boston College, Georgia Tech, Miami, Pitt, Virginia, then a couple from home, Seton Hall, St. John's, just a few. You could have gone a lot of places, could have stayed home, uh, could have gone to other top programs. This one certainly now, you don't go to back-to-back -back Elite Eights and not be top program. But what made you choose Notre Dame? Uh, first off, uh, my trusting coach. Uh, I, I love coach. I, I knew that as soon as I got here. Uh, my parents, trust coach, my brothers, everyone. Um, I know he has my back, and uh, I fell in love with campus, and I just knew it was the right, right place for me to be. Now, it's hard here. Academically, it's hard. And even the announcer will hear rumors if somebody is struggling. The team, 3.1 GPA average. I heard no rumors about anybody. So you've stepped in to maybe even a harder adjustment and have handled it. Uh, with, with great success. What has that been like for you? I'm going to brag on his numbers a little bit specifically. We have never had a freshman carry 18 credits in his first semester like TJ did. Wow. And he got a 3-0. That has never happened in my tenure. So he's, he's a man off the court, too. I'm impressed, but my brain's going, are you insane? <laughs> 18 credits. Yeah. That's incredible. So what, what do you think you're in first year of studies now? Although with 18 credits, you might be in second year of study after summer school. Where do you, what do you think you're going to major? Uh, film, theater, and television. Okay. Uh, uh, that's something that I've always wanted to do since I was little. Uh, this is a great place to be. This is a great place to start. And uh, just, just love being in front of the camera and just show my personality. You got my replacement. He's got a lot of personality. No, I could, well, you didn't already. I mean, you, they He's call got it, it it. You've got it. He's You're got so comfortable it. up here. You look good on camera. <laughs> uh, you communicate so well. But uh, I can see that. That makes a lot of sense. So uh, you already got a chance to do it on TV. But this is the longer version of the fast break. Questions <laughs> in front of a live audience. We'll uh -oh. get to that right after this timeout. It's the Mike Bray Radio Show live from O'Rourke's Public House. <laughs> We're back with Coach Bray, T.J. Gibbs. He's already done this once for TV, but only for 60 seconds. You can expound a bit, but uh -oh. who is your role model? Uh, my dad. Uh, just growing up, just watching him and just uh, and watching him go to work every day and just and just just go through everything and just uh, always keep a positive attitude. Just made my outlook on life that's that much easier and that much better. One thing the public would be surprised to learn about you. Um, I love to sing. I mean, I'm not, probably not the best singer, but I can definitely hit a tuner, hit a tuner too. I'm just checking with young, your young friend. Young lady over there <laughs> said, yeah, yeah, you can sing. Okay, <laughs> all right, we got it verified. Twitter or Instagram? Uh, definitely Twitter. Good, because most people say Instagram makes me feel old. All right, <laughs> that's good. Favorite NBA player? Uh, Kyle Lowry. Favorite part of practice? Um, definitely getting kills. 
Worst part of practice. Uh, always getting kills or other, letting the other team get a kill. Best part of your game? Um, sharing the ball, uh, attacking. Part of your game you need to work on? Uh, being more vocal, uh, being more of a leader. Which is better, knocking down a key three, dishing out a key assist, or coming up with a big steal? I'm going to go with three so you can celebrate. One thing you always hear from Coach Bray in practice. Um, don't get killed. Uh, uh, who's going to work harder today? And always go. Go as hard as you can. Looking for some comments on the uh, former Irish players on the staff. Ryan Ayers. Uh, shooter. A great shooter, a knockdown shooter. Just someone to learn from. Eric Atkins. Ooh, pesky guard uh, who's always pesky. <laughs> <laughs> who always gets after it. I, I assume you played one-on-one -on -one with him a little bit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Does he still have it? Yes, he does. Okay, okay. Yeah. Ryan Humphrey. One of the most athletic people I've yeah. played against. Harold Swanigan. Ooh, that's a good one. He seems like a, a tough big man who I would love to play with. Have you ever shown some of the screens that Harold, some night you've got to show these well, guys? Well, we've never shown them, but we talk about them. We probably should pull out the tape. No one set more illegal screens in his career <laughs> than Harold Swanigan. There's still guys in concussion protocol. It was like MFA. <laughs> People East. didn't get up. He laid them out. <laughs> Especially, unfortunately, at Seton Hall. He laid some folks he out laid them Seton out. Hall. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> he did. Player on the team most like you? Um, I'm going to have to go with Bonzi. Okay. Uh, yeah, definitely Bonzi. It's not really a team of nicknames, but is there a best nickname on the team, and who has it? Once again, Big Baby Bonzi. Big Baby. He can be a big baby all he wants this year. <laughs> Player on the team you think will surprise fans the most this season? Uh, especially Matt. I think Matt's a special player who everyone, uh, especially coming in, doubted. And he's just proven it more and more, and I think he has a lot more to prove. No question. So far, toughest place you've played, and it's a small sample, I know. What's been the hardest place? Oh, uh, this is going to be a surprise, but I think Villanova at Prudential was like yeah. a true road atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I agree, and it, yeah, it, it was, was actually a little bit more intense than in Pittsburgh in part because they're the defending national champions yeah. in rank number one. But it, there's no way that was neutral. You've got you to make that clear to the committee. It was not neutral. And you almost beat them. Best defender on the team? Uh, Steve. Best leaper on the team? VJ. Best dunker on the team? Me. Worst dunker on the team? John Mooney. <laughs> <laughs> Best dresser on the team? Uh, me. Worst dresser on the team? John Mooney. Moon. <laughs> Best singer on the team? Me. <laughs> Worst singer on the team? John Mooney. <laughs> Best comedian on the team? I love me. <laughs> All right. I think he's right on that from <laughs> what I've heard. <laughs> and our competitive question with Coach Bray for the year, beard growing competition, who wins, you or Coach Bray? Oh, definitely Coach Bray. There's not a, there's not a hair out of place on Coach Bray's body. I've, I've yet, look, look at the face. The face is everything from the top of the head See, to the beard. It's just, it's perfect. <laughs> A strange uh, turn of events here Saturday. Uh, T.J. Gibbs is starting instead of uh, <laughs> outstanding job. Thank You're you very best, much. T.J. Gibbs, baby. everybody. Thank we'll be back to wrap things up right after this timeout. Irish fans, it's time to start thinking about tires, winter tires. Our friends at TireRack.com presenting sponsors of the Mike Gray Radio Show. Have what's right for you. Headquartered just a few minutes from Purcell Pavilion, their experts know a thing or two about driving through winter's worst. And when they're not driving in it, they're on their test track or maneuvering around on the ice at a local hockey rink for winter tire testing. Also, you can get your tires right at TireRack.com. Find, deliver, install smarter. I guess now it's time to be greedy. You're off to 2-0. Wednesday, you start a semi-brutal road trip where you're at Miami, at Virginia Tech, at Florida State. Florida State beat Virginia. So how important is holding serve at home Saturday? Yeah, it's big. And, you know, one of the things I told our team today is Clemson will be the hardest game of this week, um, really because of what you've done already. There's a little bit of human nature that would say a lot of people are telling our guys how good they've been you know, to let down a little bit. Um, we, I believe, are mature enough to understand Clemson is an NCAA tournament caliber team. 
and have played well on the road. Clemson has won at South Carolina. They've won uh, at Alabama. Um, they're more of an offensive group than maybe before. They've got some transfers. We expect another knockdown drag out, and uh, to get to 3-0 and in the first week of the league would put us in a heck of a position before a brutal road trip. And they just lost to Carolina at home in overtime, a game they thought they should have won. Yeah. And you really can't sneak up on anybody. In fact, a lot of people said last night was an upset. I uh, definitely subscribe to the old Al McGuire. There's no upsets at home. But you were actually favored in the game. So any yeah. doubts people had about Notre Dame are gone. Everyone's going to approach you like the team that has made two consecutive Elite Eights yeah. and is a candidate to do it again. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, and we're, a, we're a great scalp for somebody now. But, you know, Clemson's a good scalp for us because they're a top 50 RPI team. There's a, here's the example of the great power of our league. I think we have 10, 10, 9 teams in the top 50 of the RPI. We're at like 24, Clemson maybe 37. So, you know, top 50 RPI wins are great for your NSA tournament resume. All right, Coach, thank you. It's a 3 p.m. tip-off Saturday. About 250 tickets left, so hopefully you'll sell it out. Cheer on this Irish team as they try to go to 3-0 and in the ACC this season. Our thanks to T.J. Gibbs, who did a great job as our uh, guest tonight, and all of you who uh, made it out on a cold, wintry night uh, to watch our show tonight. And also thanks to our great staff who got us on the air and uh, presented a great product. So until we're gone for a couple of weeks, we're off next week. We're back in two weeks. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody, and go Irish.